it is over. The Attack on Titan anime has officially concluded with the release of its final episode. This story has had incredible significance in both anime and manga communities for over a decade, and I myself have been with it since the very beginning of season 1. Saying farewell feels surreal, and I'd like to express my gratitude for this story by viewing it as a whole. Today we will cover as many of the central beats of Attack on Titan, this behemoth of a narrative in retrospect. We will view the story as a whole with consideration to the context of its conclusion. I hope hope to assess the intricacies of its construction, the meticulous planning that formed this story of a cruel, beautiful world much like our own, to really dig into the first manga published by Hajime Isayama, one I struggle to see him ever exceed. What is the angle Isayama had taken in regards to his social commentary? What do the mechanics present within the story contribute to in the larger scheme of said commentary? How does Attack on Titan's world reflect upon our own, and what can we extract from it both on our personal lives and on a broader sociological level. What does it all mean for the sensitive subject matter explored, the human condition as it is? What is Hajime Isayama's view on the world and how does he go about exploring this view in his story? These are just a few of the questions I will be attempting to uncover over the course of this video. I hope you enjoy and as always, please do share your thoughts in the comment section below. Something I think we can all agree on is that Attack on Titan is a story that somewhat requires the reader to imbue their own values onto it. Their interpretations and reception of the content is contingent upon the way they see things. This is the case for most stories, but when the subject matter is as dark and as relevant as Attack on Titans, this can be rather tricky. And I would wager that this is the key reason for the controversy of its ending. The end of Attack on Titan was particularly divisive especially at the time of its release in the manga. Seldom has there been a conclusion to a story in the Japanese media space that has torn apart a fanbase as supportive as Attack on Titans, so much so that there are no examples in recent history that even remotely match the extreme reaction of the fans on both ends of the spectrum. Endings to fictional stories will always be controversial to an extent. Nothing will ever be unanimously loved and supported, but the sheer hatred for the end of Attack on Titan specifically is worth looking into. To really find a story in this space with a similarly divided reception to its ending, we would have to go back to 1997 and the end of Evangelion. This in of itself creates an interesting picture because upon further inspection there are in fact a multitude of similarities and direct inspirations between Evangelion and Attack on Titan, ranging from their similar use of symbology, their approach to constructing their respective protagonists' mind frames, the same K nature of both narratives and of course so much about their endings. The cyclicality present in both conclusions forms a retroactive lens to view the entire story from, which is always going to be a risky decision for a storyteller. By actively tampering with the perception of prior events you are changing things, which leads to differences in reception. Most importantly though, these are endings that aim to make the viewer reflect upon themselves in an existential way. These stories are very conscious of reality, pulling us into an exploration of the individual and society, asking and trying to answer questions many people wonder, like what are we doing here? Both stories hold a mirror to their viewers and I'd argue that this at its core is the main reason for the controversy of their conclusions. I think the difference in the discourse of AOT's final chapter versus its final episode is telling. Nothing significant was changed, some lines were slightly adjusted or added, and the ending was far better received, which just goes to show how so much of the story is in the details. Attack on Titan actively integrates the viewer's expectations and often conflicting dispositions into the commentary itself, with the layout of its final arc and how both sides of the final conflict are comprised of characters we have grown attached to. And this can get problematic when the commentary concerns the genocide of the entire entire human race. On the flip side though, it makes for a very interesting story, one that reveals just as much about the viewer as it does the author. And I'll be diving into exactly why I personally respect Isayama's final say and the thematic crux of this story as we progress through the video. 
One trend that quickly becomes apparent upon retrospection is the fact that Isayama almost obsessively structures his series in a way that enables individual chunks of it to function as a micro expression of the larger narrative. Little nuggets of the story that tell the same overarching story. This becomes especially impressive in viewing the earlier segments, as arguably the strongest example of this is none other than Trost. Right from the very beginning, we witness people dehumanise themselves and others, as is made apparent with the large carrier that was supposed to go through the gate before any of the people could, prioritising the product over the lives of human beings, all fuelled by the fear of death and the drive to preserve. Another instance is when Eren saves Mikasa from her kidnappers, after brutally killing them them, he refers to them as beasts, even going as far as to tell Grisha that they only happen to resemble humans, a clear showcase of Eren's nature and his intrinsic rage towards everything that limits people. This was not something he was forced or even told to do, but the young boy killed the kidnappers nonetheless. There's the iconic dreamscape conversation between Eren and Armin, something that closely resembles the final chapter and the nature of their dialogue there. In fact, 139's iteration is clearly framed as a direct follow-up to the Trost conversation, which presented all the questions that are then explored in the final chapter. The outside world, the different sights, the curiosity that drives Armin, the rage that drives Eren, how he has not once visualised these landscapes but rather has only ever been in love with the idea of nothing hindering him from going there, absolute freedom to do as he wishes. As early as chapter 14, we see how Eren runs contrary to Armin, who sees these heights as holding value in and of themselves. That is why Eren must deceive himself into believing that he is free when he performs the rumbling. He takes the form of himself as a child, symbolic of ignorance, the same state he previously referred to as the thing furthest removed from freedom. It is made to look as if he is flying, birds and flight being a universal symbol of freedom, but in truth he's actually trapped between the titan smoke he's on top of and the clouds that are on top of him. And again, this visual is eerily reminiscent of Eren's visualisation of the different sights indicative of his perception of freedom in chapter 14. Carrying the boulder to plug Wu Rose is a clear symbolic reference to Atlas carrying the entire world on his back, a clear play on Eren's eventual godlike function within the narrative. The presentation of Eren not fully understanding his own driving motivations, instead echoing the words of his mother when confronted with why he wants to go outside the walls, is another nod to the final chapter. Eren views the freedom to venture outside as a birthright that was taken from him. It's very clear to see how Trust features all the themes the series goes on to define itself by, and on a page to page basis, it is astonishing just how closely it mirrors the very end, showing just how cohesive and thought out this story was right from the very beginning up until the very end. To stress on Isayama's structuring and the brilliance of Attack on Titan's framework, we need look no further than the constant reiteration of very integral ideas, different recurring motifs that are applied onto the entire cast, like the fact that each important character has their own that day. This could be a significant event, a key memory, a moment in their childhoods that has impacted them for life, and it generally serves as a big source of equal parts motivation and trauma. For Mikasa, we have the day Eren saved her from the kidnappers and imbued her with the desire to live. For Eren, we obviously have the day the colossal titan broke through Wu Maria and the subsequent invasion of Shiganshina, resulting in the death of his mother. For Grisha, that day would be the day he took Faye outside the walls and was forced to bear witness to the world's cruelty. For Zeke, it would be the day he decided to tell the authorities about his father's regime. Levi's mother dying and Kenny adopting him, imprinting him with some of the core principles he lives by to this day. Kenny meeting Yuri, or the day Armin chased Mikasa and Eren towards the tree on the hill. There are way more examples. It is clear to see how Isayama has structured and implemented this motif throughout the story, and how much it resonates with each and every main idea that gets explored. I like to view AOT as this complex, intricate web of characters and ideas that all work in terrific harmony to tell the same story again and again and again with slight nuances to differentiate them and give each case its own individual function in the larger framework.
Visually too, Isayama assigns value to a distinct set of specific symbols and visuals that go on to perfectly represent the most important ideas of the story in as many instances as possible. This is something I just have to mention and share my love for because AOT's presentation, especially in the latter half of the manga, is instrumental to my appreciation and understanding of the story. Not only is the art absolutely masterful in so many ways, there are several visual motifs and repeating patterns that that show up again and again to reinforce the exploration of certain ideas. For example, the very frequent utilization of the tree motif, as evidenced with the tree on the hill, the children of the forest theme, or even the Yggdrasil world tree in Paths. The tree works because it complements the generationally informed backdrop of Attack on Titan, the exploration of life itself, the cyclicality and the struggles of the world's inhabitants, and how so much of their suffering is mutual and passed on to them over centuries. The panelling is incredibly intentional in both meaning and format. A key example of this is how memories are presented as singular shards that break apart, or even Isayama's insane number flexes, only ever numbering the 13th page in chapter 1, highlighting the significance of that number in the context of the story. These two sequences from Zeke and Ymir respectively last for 13 pages after the acquisition of their titan powers, and they end in identical fashion, with their supposed death. This serves to echo the 13 year titan curse and how Ymir died 13 years after her receival of the power. Up there is one of the most important moments of the series. 13 arms point at Ymir to blame her for releasing the pig in her flashback. Through his presentation, Isayama actively integrated the medium into the story in a really quite gripping way. I mean, you have people convinced this bird is an extension of Eren somehow, and the series facilitates these kinds of interpretations with its use of symbology, which is pretty funny and impressive in of itself. Isayama's artwork becomes all the more impressive in hindsight considering the sketchy, unrefined style of the beginning. Even then though, the detailing in characters' mannerisms, both behaviour and body language, the panelling in select sequences, the visual symbolism, and just the artwork as a whole in some pages was impressive for Isayama's first few years as a professional mangaka, and in hindsight, the evolution he would go on to have should have been evident from the beginning. Something I respect about Attack on Titan is how it places emphasis on exploring the manner in which events come to pass, and in particular, the way they manifest. Nothing really strikes me as just being there for shock value or dramatic effect. Everything seems intentional and ties back to the core ideas at play, ultimately culminating in the conclusion. This is all done in consideration to what AOT hopes to achieve, to focus on how to utilise experiences to carve out a path towards a better future. To understand the effect, you must understand the cause. Differentiating between how and why things come to pass is, in essence, differentiating between the past and the future. While ruminating on things that happen often culminates in lament that can paralyse you, rendering you a powerless bystander of zero use to anybody including yourself, thinking about how things happen inspires action, preemptive measures, things to look out for and to avoid. You learn of the mistakes you should not make. There are several examples of Isayama differentiating between how and why in the series, one of which being the collective philosophy of the Survey Corps under Erwin. Erwin's methodology and the way reality is processed by his soldiers is interesting. Death as a consequence is not only accepted but expected. Each sacrifice is another minute bought for the pursuit of that better future. Every minute is an opportunity to learn a new way to survive and adapt. In a way, this entire perspective is rather stoic, not worrying about the things outside of one's grasp and power, and ensuring the preservation of life and the progress to a better life is at the forefront of one's mind, dealing with reality as it comes at you and attempting your best to learn from it. Quite a nurturing perspective, one that is not preoccupied with forcing expectations upon a reality that owes you nothing. It is a trait many of the characters grapple with but hold nonetheless, having been tempered by their experiences. But it is this characteristic which Eren lacks. 
he burns too bright. Eren is used to paint the picture of the other side of the coin, a boy driven by a profound frustration with the state of the world he was born into, and one whose flame burns so intensely that it burns anything within his path. Till this day, people debate over whether Eren is a product of his environment or otherwise, whether the setting in which he was born into played a significant role in forming his person. I don't want to adamantly claim one way or the other, there are several nuances at play that suggest both nature and nurture serve significant roles in the construction of Eren Jaeger's character. Having said that, so much of Eren is definitely informed by this innate nature of his, a hate for limitations that would have existed regardless of his surroundings but is of course exacerbated by them, arguably even contingent to them. The walls that keep him caged, the rules that tell him what to do, the titans that prevent him from seeing the vastness of the world, the look in Armin's eyes he craves and envies deep down. Eren's hatred is continuously extrapolated upon the next thing he views as an obstacle, a constant chain of endless obstacles, and it is exactly this disposition of his that entirely robs him of the very thing he is striving for. This irony defines Eren as a character, and it is also the thing that makes him the perfect case study on the discrepancy between how and why. So many of the integral facets of his character are underlined by this irony, be it his attempt at escaping the walls only resulting in him pushing them forward via the rumbling. His whole slogan of moving forward standing in stark contrast to the static nature of his character, the detachment he displays in the way fate plays out, or even the etymological meaning of his name which I'll get into further down the line. One thing that reframes our perception of the entire story is the significance of the theme of love in the final act. Love is the reason this story ever happened, and love is the reason it could end. In retrospect, I think it's clear to see how ever-present it was from the very beginning. The series spends a significant amount of time trying to find meaning in the cruelty of the world, trying to make sense of the chaos everyone finds themselves within, and the conclusion it arrives at is that love itself use things with meaning. It is that conclusion which many characters organically arrive at at the end of their respective journeys, be it Zeke whose entire worldview was clouded by his trauma, someone who could not find any inherent meaning in life arriving at the conclusion that it is indeed a wonderful day, be it Mikasa who from the beginning has had praying mantis symbolism associated with her and who, just like a mantis, ends up beheading the subject of her love for the sake of a better future. Love is both the source and the solution to the cycles of hatred that plague this world. Platonic, familial, romantic, whatever, love or the same. This is well represented in Kenny and Yuri's dynamic, that miracle that brought them together. The capacity for enemies to become friends through mutual understanding and empathy. In moments where the characters don't think, those small and seemingly insignificant moments of intimacy and fun are what makes up the meaning in their life. It is what imbues their existence with a sense of purpose and in hindsight, each of those moments we may have once viewed as trivial become some of the most important moments in the story. How Zeke said he could have continued playing catch all day with Kusava. How Armin thought to himself that chasing after Mikasa and Eren towards that tree on that hill might have been the reason for his existence in the first place. Moments we may not have thought much of at first but mean the world now. And this is the case not just for the reader but for the characters also. It is exactly this grounded love that Eren was lacking, the very love he was too preoccupied to see. Blinded by rage, by frustration that the things he deems a birthright have been forced out of his reach, he continues forward. Regardless of what actually lies beyond the walls, it is the walls themselves which are the subject of his hatred. Not how or why they exist, but the mere fact they do exist. Eren never overcame these walls quite literally pushing them forward while remaining behind them as he flattened 80% of humanity. This makes the fact that Mikasa is the first and last thing Eren saw within the manga that much more significant as it ties together this entire subtextual commentary that emerged front and center in chapter 138. Despite his awareness of the future, or rather precisely due to said awareness, Eren is in essence paralyzed. 
closed. He sees fates unfold in exactly the manner he has perceived ever since kissing Historia's hand, yet he has been little more than an observer of the script he has read. That is not to be confused with him doing nothing. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It is his own desire, the essence of his person, that has led him to chain himself to this story and its cyclical nature. A god who is a product of his environment to some extent, yet is at his core self-determined and not bound by anything but himself. From victim to propagator, Eren is Attack on Titan. He is consumed by his story in this world and submits to its cruelty. What's necessary to consider is that Eren's experience of himself cannot be compared to anyone else's. The way he perceives things is completely different. In Eren's eyes, everything that will happen has already happened. It has only happened because he chose to make it happen, but before he chose to do so, he witnessed himself making it happen, which shackles him to the choice of making it happen. We can continue that loop forever. That is the crippling, cyclical existence of Eren Jaeger. The combination of the attack and founding Titan's powers allow him to view the memories of Eldians, and so in essence, he is robbed of any type of experience being new to him, as showcased during the beach scene. What should be this incredibly gratifying moment of celebration is a heart-wrenching confirmation of his father's memories. Eren's sense of self, his perception of the world, is tainted by not only the intrinsic nature that he was born with, but also the perspective of all these people whose eyes he has also experienced reality through. This leads to further disassociation and detachment within Eren's psyche, which culminates with his arrival in Mali and his observation of the people living there. He stands among them fully aware that he is the one who will one day, soon in the future, end all of their lives. But even then he was still disassociating, not fully in the clear about why everything he is doing is what he wants. He only comes to understand himself in the last chapter during his conversation with Armin. Titans are one of the most important narrative tools in the story. They serve a variety of functions across various aspects of Attack on Titan, and so they more than deserve their own section in this retrospective. To begin, let's delve into the significance of the worm, the source as it is referred to in the story. The worm itself closely resembles the Hallucigenia lobopod in its design, an organism that dates back to the Cambrian era around 538 million years ago. Within the series, it is slightly hinted to be the very source of life itself. As such, the Hallucigenia itself has no agenda. It has no inherent desire other than to preserve and multiply itself, a characteristic that Zeke ascribes the Hallucigenia's survival to. This in turn ties into its ability to grant the wishes of organisms that it comes into contact with. It seems to have a way of manifesting the innate desires of all life it connects with. Just as it is the wish of a tree to grow big and mighty, so was it the wish of Ymir to have a big, mighty, undying body and to escape to a plane in which she was free of death and thus free of fear. Ymir's innate desire for life made the Hallucigenia, the source, latch onto her, and through the act of Fritz and her daughters, the innate capacity for the Titan curse multiplied just like the Hallucigenia is designed to. This then becomes interesting when we inspect the ways in which the worm has been framed within the narratives. Throughout history, History, the story of Ymir and the acquisition of the Titan curse has been presented as either a deal with the devil or a blessing from God. Yet as we know the Hallucigenia is neither, it is a blank state devoid of any reason or features, a canvas that simply reflects and amplifies whatever is projected onto it. This encapsulates the function of the Titans in general and ties into a big portion of the commentary. The impact of framing, the weaponization of language and history, how the very same idea can be expressed in in two opposing ways and how, in essence, ideas are just a tool that reflects its wielder. The Titans as a concept serve a multitude of purposes within the story. The ways they are used are incredibly diverse, and from how they are constructed, there are several angles from which to extract different interesting details. Within the story, and in regards to the commentary, Titans serve the purpose of acting as a manifestation of human projection. This is the case on several layers. For one, they are the literal manifestation of Ymir's desires upon coming into contact with the source, and their construction reveals as much. 
much. Their need to consume and the lack of any apparent course of action other than eating humans is one twisted way in which Ymir's desire to connect manifested. Yet in practice they are futile attempts. Not only do the Titans lack any way of actually digesting the humans they eat, they essentially only eat them as long as their stomachs have the capacity, throwing them up as soon as they are full. This robs the act of eating humans of any type of sustenance or nurturing aspect. It is a pointless act of cruelty, something that reflects Ymir's broken internal state. Titans can only come from subjects of Ymir, and for most of the story, the Titans' victims are Eldians and subjects of Ymir. They are being eaten by their own flesh and blood, and everything is underpinned by this little girl. Ymir thought she had not had a single successful bonding experience, that her feelings were never reciprocated within her life and as such, the pursuit of connection became a one-sided struggle, as one-sided as being eaten without nourishing your predator. The curse is only lifted when Ymir realises that she did have true love, she did have her feelings reciprocated by her children. Ymir's lack of agency is seen even in the construction of her character over the course of the story. She is first introduced through a book, as a lesson to Historia on how to behave, then she is used as a tool of worship that the other Ymir is roped into, and then she's used as a tool of propaganda on both sides of the Eldian Malian conflict. Commentary wise, there's a strong political undercurrent in the Titan's designs, being strongly reminiscent of historical art used for propaganda in times of war. This is a very deliberate decision, as the number one goal of such propaganda has always been one thing, dehumanising the enemy. By dehumanising a population of people, you are, in essence, robbing them of the very rights and privileges you assign yourself. It is an effective tool in creating a rift in the nature of your people and the other, the enemy, in turn making it easier to legitimise harsher treatment of said demographics by presenting them as lower than humans, assigning them characteristics akin to monsters or animals, exaggerating their features and robbing them of their humanity. And in many ways, the Titans also function as a cautionary tale for self-fulfilling prophecies. The longer you indoctrinate a people and convince them that they are monsters, the longer this image and facade will persevere, and the longer it perseveres, the stronger it will manifest, first in the thoughts and then in the action of the people. Not only do the titans, emblematic of things discussed so far, rob humanity of their freedom in paradise, they are also the very thing making up the walls that keep them simultaneously safe and caged, meaning that that projection and dehumanization, the othering of people, is what is endangering, protecting and imprisoning humanity all at once. A crazy efficient way of conducting this commentary with the building blocks present in the series, which as one would expect from this story, places perspective above all. The very foundation of the titans being the plight of a young girl even further refines the picture, bringing in the ambivalence the series has made one of its trademarks. Cause and effect are are equal, the future is intrinsically tied to the past and vice versa, and as such, the reason for humanity's plight and suffering is humanity itself. The utilisation of titans creates an extraordinary web of interlinked ideas and symbols that function together to orchestrate the obsessive commentary that Isayama has made his task to conduct. Titans are as important as any other character, they are representative of humanity in its most extreme form. Forms. A tie can be made to the tale of the Golem of Prague, or the concept of golems in Jewish folklore at large. In this classic tale, a rabbi in Prague creates a golem out of inanimate matter for the purpose of protecting the Jewish community in the city from the pogroms who were essentially organising mass expulsions and massacres of ethnic minorities. To fight back was honourable of the rabbi. However, due to unforeseen circumstances, the golem instead went on a murderous rampage. It is clear to see that this tale places emphasis on the discrepancy in intent and consequence, and how the oppressed can very easily become the oppressor. The golem's nature is also ambivalent enough to project anyone onto it. It could be a man or woman, elder or child, 
assailant, victim or perpetrator. And it is this exact characteristic Isayama has masterfully integrated into the building blocks of his story. This tie becomes even further substantiated when we look at the Attack on Titan prototype chapter. This one shot from 2006 that was submitted to Weekly Shonen Jump gives us a great deal of insight into Isayama's intentions in writing this story. It greatly differs from the series we eventually got. The setting is Japan, and the Titans are the result of a religious group's failed experiment, which is more or less identical to the classical narrative of the Golem of Prague, showing us just how diverse Isayama's streams of inspiration are. What ties this extensive context together within the series is how Titans have been used within the history of Attack on Titan, namely as tools of war, be it in live combat as expendable mercenaries, the use of the Titans' abilities like Carl Fritz wiping the memory of an entire nation, or something like the activation of the rumbling. They are characterized by propaganda, dehumanization, and unfulfilling, endless consumption. So of course, it's expected that the Titans would quite literally be used as tools of war. They are objects in the control and manipulation of information to keep an entire population in check and mentally castrated enough to submit to the status quo. The Titans are also a reflection of the very people who oppose them, the very people they consume. While emblematic of the way dehumanization can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, as most things in Attack on Titan, this idea has to be inspected from both sides. As much as people tend to dehumanize others, they are also willing to dehumanize even themselves if pushed to fear for their life. No scene is quite as emblematic of that as Armin in the final chapter. If we did still have the power of the Titans, we'd be using it to fight you. But the fact that we continue to be powerless as you point your guns at us is the greatest possible proof of our humanity, a microcosm of the way people consistently dehumanize themselves as much as the people who they dehumanize, how they are willing to become the objects of their horrors if it means preserving their lives. The Marlians dehumanizing themselves with the guns they point at the Eldians, and the Eldians dehumanizing themselves by resorting to the threat of potentially turning into titans. These emotional responses, these primal fears that lead humans down a path of cruelty, make for the very breeding ground on which the cycles of violence and hatred propagate. At each act of violence's core is the desire to stay alive. Within the context of the early story, and with regard to how the picture about the titans and their nature continue to expand, it becomes easy to see the intended effect. Where early on they were viewed as the very bane of humanity's existence, as the oppressor keeping them caged like birds, the image got flipped on its head. To many, like Eren, these creatures had become the object of all their hate and frustration, which then makes it increasingly difficult to swallow that the Titans are a reflection of themselves, of what they could potentially become. When the realization settles in that the Titans are their own people, their own flesh and blood, it becomes hard to make sense of the world. Finding out about humanity beyond the shore, finding out about the curse of the Eldian people, completely robs the characters of any one enemy to project their hatred onto, robbing them of a clear sense of direction. You can tell that right from the very beginning, this is the story Isayama had always wanted to tell, everything following the basement reveal. The only truth that remained was echoed by Gabi. There weren't any devils on this island, no, just humans. The cycles of war, violence, and hatred. These cycles are best presented within the Children of the Forest theme. A metaphor for the children, in essence everyone's inner child, who are lost in the forest without any guidance from the adults, their forefathers. They are plunged into the forest from birth and forced to make do with their limited perspectives. This motif is introduced to us by Mr. Braun, Sasha's father. It is integrated into several aspects of the series, both in a literal sense as well as thematically and with regards to characterization. There are the countless moments that take place within forests, the scenarios in which characters actively integrate the forest into their strategies. We have the fact that Ymir was quite literally a child chased into a forest when she made contact with the Lucigenia, as a result creating the titan curse stemming from her trauma. There is Zeke, whose entire character is informed by this theme. Not only is a bulk of his screen time spent in forests, but he is so lost in this metaphorical forest that he completely distances himself from the world, to the point of not seeing the benefit of existence, resulting in the rejection of humanity he displays with the euthanasia plan. Then there's the fact that his titan form is a literal ape, which makes his ties to the forest
forest theme clear enough. At the very end, Zeke comes to realize what a wonderful day it is, how the very things he had always sought were right in front of his eyes, hiding in plain sight. The trees that were blinding him have vanished and his skies have cleared, quite literally. The world itself did not change, what did was his perception of it, and he came to realize how warped it was and how he pretty much robbed himself of this beautiful sight up until his final moments. The cycle of violence and all that it entails is intrinsically explored through a cyclical lens. The entire narrative as well as all the characters inhabiting its world are structured in a way that echoes and reinforces the cyclicality that Isayama ascribes the nature of reality to. This calls to mind lines like Ere were all the same, addressing Reiner in the basement. Parallels like Gabi and Eren, the fundamental things that drive us as humans portrayed through the likes of Ramsay and Helil, mirroring the likes of Willy, Erwin and Eren. How perspectives can switch as though they were the toss of a coin, as evidenced in the entire beach scene and the basement reveals reframing of the story up until that point. Attack on Titan seems almost desperate in its utilization of cyclicality in each of its layers, as if to plead to the reader to take notice of them. The world is defined by the trauma of a little girl. Ymir Fritz is a product of said cycle of hatred, one so affected by it that she established an entire parallel world in which she slaves away endlessly. In this one way, she mirrors Eren, the other character whose intrinsic desire has shaped the reality he inhabits. The entire story is riddled with characters who are victims of a cycle that they themselves didn't start, but definitely propagate by allowing it to inform every one of their actions. In a lot of ways, the cycle of hatred is the primary antagonist of Attack on Titan. The series spends a significant amount of its runtime posing the question of who the enemy is, and the more we progress, the clearer it becomes that it was humanity itself, or rather the negative aspects of humanity that continually breed and amplify with each and every generation. And all this is used to wonderfully explore the interplay and differences between nature and nurture, whereas one's nature is not something that can be entirely discarded, there is nothing intrinsically forcing one to abide by it. As such, arguably as important as one nature is the world in which one is nurtured. Nobody chooses their circumstances, yet as time progresses and we gain more clarity and insight into life itself, we are more and more able to control how we react to the world, the ways in which we assign meaning to events. In a sense, the story we choose to write. However, that idea is very very romantic, and an undeniable truth of the world is that people oftentimes succumb to their circumstances. They let their experience control their decisions, and in many ways they become a product of their environment. They allow their story to be written for them contributing to patterns and cycles that propagate through time and in turn create further generations that continue this never-ending cycle. To varying degrees, you can categorize the cast into three main clusters. The ones who fully abide by their nature and desires, Eren being the best example here, but Annie also fits the bill. The ones who are primarily informed by environmental factors like their upbringings and the propaganda around them, like Gabi, Magath, Zeke and Grisha, and finally those who internalize aspects of both, with a prime example here being Reiner. This heavily plays into the deterministic facets of Attack on Titan. Both nature and nurture are but factors in the larger equation known as fate, and the more factors one has, the closer one gets to solving this equation, meaning the future can be predicted and in turn that it is set in stone. Although most notably, that is not where the series stops with this thought process. It goes a step further and proposes a compatibilist approach, one that seeks to convey that determinism and free will are not mutually exclusive, but rather that they can coexist within the same reality. While it is undeniably true that Eren's future was set in stone, it is just as true that his future was a product of his own desire, quite a literal application of compatibilism, one that explores a subject that is fully aware of his future and the steps towards said future, but it is said awareness that in turn contributes to his plight and the guaranteed nature of the way events unfold. And thus, it is ironic how in various instances, characters in the story end up becoming the very thing they vowed to oppose. Isayama's way of constructing these twists of fate is underlined by a vague sense of dark humour, 
almost, considering some of the examples I'm about to share. Eren Kruger aimed to save the Eldians from the Marlians' barbaric treatment, yet he ended up spending a significant amount of his life directly contributing to their suffering. Zeke originally wanted to help the world get rid of the fear of Titans, but in practice what he does is basically creates even more Titans and further amplify the fear and hatred towards Eldians. Mikasa, who has made it her primary task to protect Eren at all costs, sees herself forced into the circumstances of having to kill him for the greater good of humanity. And most prominently, we have Eren himself. Even early on, when he first transforms into a Titan, we had the early building blocks. The irony of the boy who swore to eradicate the Titans becoming himself a Titan. And to add to that, he joins the Survey Corps for the explicit purpose of killing these Titans. Yet it is the Survey Corps who oppose him in the end, and he uses the object of his initial anger, the Titans themselves, to conduct the rumbling and kill 80% of life on Earth. There are valuable lessons here. Examples of how, despite the best of intentions, people might lose themselves in the process of fanatically following their goals. How a righteous spark can turn into a cruel flame. A good person across the board does not exist. Everybody is kind to some and cruel to others, but even when people hurt others, it is often done out of their own perceived good intentions. The common denominator of these examples is the idea of sacrifice. How much one is willing to sacrifice in the pursuit of change, in the pursuit of a goal larger than themselves. How sacrifice is a necessity for change, that the world does not allow one to have their cake and eat it too. One of the ultimate expressions of the cycle of violence the fight for humanity, the compatibilist philosophy of the story, and everything else I have previously outlined comes in the form of information. How, throughout the history of Attack on Titan, the elites have withheld information from the general populace. How the masses are pressured into being subservient and complicit via the threat of violence and death. How the flow of information and how it is controlled stands in direct correlation with the continued existence of conflicts and suffering on a larger scale. And that is why one of Attack on Titan's biggest pursuits is the pursuit of truth both thematically as well as in a literal sense. The driving motivation of characters like Erwin, Hange, and Armin is pure curiosity, a pure thirst for knowledge. It is this pursuit of truth that has brought the squad as far as the return to Shiganshina. It is this pursuit of truth which has enabled them to visit Eren's basements and uncover the documents of Grisha. And in turn, it is exactly this pursuit of truth which has led to the discovery of the rest of humanity beyond the ocean and the actual vastness of the world they inhabit. And with each revelation came new questions, a need to retrace history itself and find out the truth about what happened 2000 years ago. All of these milestones, all these steps have only ever been taken due to people seeking knowledge, often at the expense of their own life. It is exactly this pursuit which makes Attack on Titan such an effective mystery story. Throwing us into a world that is an incoherent nightmare to even its inhabitants makes for an ideal template to build a mystery around having us make realizations at the same time as the characters, each major piece of context further expanding the picture by zooming out. The idea is flipped on its head as we transition into post time skip, where the mystery is no longer concerning truth or the nature of the world, but the plans of Eren Jaeger himself. What was once the character we thought we knew best is now an elusive, confusing husk of a man who simply keeps moving forward until his enemies are destroyed. We don't understand what's going on inside of his head, and neither does he. Our central cast is composed, particularly in the beginning, of the Survey Corps. They make up the core of the series, and it is through their lens that Attack on Titan is both conveyed and framed. They are the heart of this story, men and women doing their best to represent and defend humanity in each situation. That is seen from very early on. As mentioned previously, trust functions as a good microcosm of the larger narrative, and that is especially true in this regard. In a situation where humans are wholly occupied with the drive to survive, a circumstance in which neither morals nor laws persist, our main characters do their very best to not only break up any infighting and allow the quick passage of civilians, but also risk their own lives to save as many people as possible. It is also our squad, excluding the warrior trio, that is responsible for the immense development 
confidence in seeking the truth of the world, marching forward until the return to Shiganshina, facing the beast, colossal and armored titans, and finally, after major sacrifices like the life of their commander, getting to Eren's basement and uncovering the truth about Male and Paradis. It is the aforementioned curiosity-driven figures like Erwin, Hanj and Armin that keep the focus of the group intact and make them work as a single cohesive body. These characters have made it an integral part of their identity to always seek truth, to avoid ignorance and learn as much as they possibly can within their lifetime and in that sense they embody the core of what the Survey Corps stands for, dedicating your life to a task bigger than yourself, shedding your attachment to life, and in essence giving away your existence as an individual, becoming instead a walking sacrifice for the greater good. The saying, dedicate your heart, is in fact quite literal, and honestly the most fitting slogan Isayama could have come up with for the Survey Corps. Their mission is to work towards a common goal, to strive and achieve as much as they each can within the spark we call life, shouldering the goals, aspirations and lives of their fallen comrades, and to then ultimately pass on the baton to whoever lives on. That is what being a Survey Corps member is all about, which is wonderfully exemplified by Connie and Jean's conversation just before their transformation and perceived deaths in the penultimate chapter. To do your best and die knowing that others will carry on in your pursuit. And that is how the final alliance between all parties makes the initial role of saving humanity come full circle, not differentiating between race and status, working towards one goal, against one enemy that is threatening the very idea of humanity. While in the beginning, the misconception was that humanity only survived within the walls, meaning that killing all the titans on Paradis did not actually save all of humanity, at the very end the Survey Corps truly did save all of humanity, a beautifully poignant way of closing that chapter. Levi and Mikasa share very similar roles within the story, two of the very few characters who survive beyond the rumbling and embody one side of the core ethos of Attack on Titan best. The two Ackermen are used as vehicles to explore the nurturing approach of life, standing in stark contrast with Eren. This dichotomy is present on several layers, the first being their names. Eren's surname Jaeger means hunter in German, very obviously painting the picture of a predator whose purpose it is to snuff out life. On the other side we have the name Ackerman, quite literally translating to man of the field, a name that hints at a characteristic that preserves life, one that tends to, nurtures it. In essence we have the contrast between a hunter and a farmer, two occupations that aim for similar things but approach them in profoundly different ways. At their core both the hunter and the farmer strive for sustenance, the preservation of one's own life is a driving force in both cases, yet where they diverge is that the hunter actively snuffs out living things as a premise for his own survival. He robs the other's freedom to affirm his own, whereas the farmer has to spend significant time first bringing forth life to then in turn gain the necessary sustenance for survival from it. The farmer doesn't rob anyone's freedom, in fact it is the enabler of the freedom of others in the first place. Applying this to Levi first, we can very clearly see this characteristic manifest in his hero complex. As most in the story, Levi too is a product of his environment. Some Someone who has grown up with the idea of his self-worth being tied to his strength and thus does everything to prove this strength of his. Having also associated Kenny's abandonment of him with a lack of strength, Levi is the one who has tasked himself with a sense of obligation and duty few ever reach, and his self-critical nature makes him very hard on himself. This, coupled with his position next to Erwin, had turned him into an emblem of sorts, and his mere presence is something that inspires hope and courage with in the hearts of many of the characters. He is like a beacon that leads the way, and he does his best at making the right decision at every turn, even at the expense of his own wishes. The choice to keep Armin alive instead of Erwin being unique in that Serum Ball is just such an incredibly multi-layered drama with countless nuances. Levi's choice there was equally selfless as it was selfish. The man who placed the fight for humanity above all else succumbed to his own kindness. He allowed Erwin to pass on, freeing him from the burden of his life's endless pursuit, despite fully believing that using the serum on Erwin was the better choice for the sake of humanity. He is human after all, and making mistakes is intrinsic to humanity, if we can even call Levi's choice a mistake. 
Given Levi's high standards for himself as well as his function as a guiding light for humanity, he makes for an ideal breeding ground in regards to cultivating and refining the youth he commands, and in general he is actively tending to the field called the future. This makes his last scene, giving lollipops to refugee children, all the more fitting and poetic. As one would expect, Mikasa too is a character who is incredibly reliable, and one whose characteristics match up with the nurturing elements ascribed to an Ackerman. Not only does she do her best to keep Eren safe, but throughout the narrative it becomes very clear that Mikasa, similar to Levi, is a preserver of life and a hero in the eyes of many. This aligns with Attack on Titan's concept of living with pride, to live abiding by one's conscience, to be in tune with your desires and be autonomous. For Mikasa, pride is being of service to life in paradise. She is born into royalty and she rejects that due to her strong agency and sense of purpose. She wants to watch over the future of the island that birthed and raised her. A stark contrast to Ymir who was born a slave and accepted royalty out of a lack of agency, in hopes of finding purpose. In Midnight Sun, when Levi was forced to make his choice, we see a clear contrast between Mikasa and Eren. They are both in absolute dismay when faced with the reality of Armin's death, but unlike Eren, who remains hysterical throughout, Mikasa conquers her emotions here. The sheer resilience she showcases to be able to accept a reality like this so quickly is nothing short of remarkable. She loses her mind, of course she does, and it takes everything from her to submit here, but she does. The victim of grief and trauma, whose found family is her literal reason for being, forced to heal at the cruelty of the world, yet still clinging to its beauty. An almost exact mirror to not just 138, but her moment in trust, following Eren's first supposed death. Mikasa's spirit is indomitable, and it always has been. She also directly impacts Eren's disposition more than anybody else. From the very early days, he has always carried himself differently around her, putting on a brave face, trying to act more stoic and independent whenever she was around, just so he could look better in front of her. And then after he receives the Attack Titan memories, Mikasa becomes more vital than ever in regards to his identity and his aspirations of plans for the future and for himself. Due to the unique abilities of the Attack Titan, every remotely new experience becomes a further hope in his quest for freedom. And so it is no wonder that Mikasa is the very first and very last thing that Eren sees within the manga. His eyes within the Titan are closed, and the moment he opens them, his head has already been detached, effectively making his last look at Mikasa a totally new experience that he has not been robbed of via the ability of his Titan. Mikasa is the perfect lens through which to explore the beauty in this cruel world. Her character displays how, despite being caged and robbed of a peaceful life, one can still be free and enjoy life for what it gives you. Indeed, it is cruel that she has to be the one to kill the one she loves the most, but it is simultaneously more than Eren could have ever asked for, having the love of his life be the one to gift him these completely new experiences, ones he could not make for himself. And if we attribute the fact that killing Eren effectively ended the rumbling and saved the remaining 20% of humanity, we can see how the Ackerman function as a preserver and nurturer of life manifests. Mikasa's existence enables the aforementioned Sekai K elements of Attack on Titan to work in the first place. Sekai K describes a style of narrative in which the central dynamic is of the utmost importance, and it heavily informs and is extrapolated upon the entire narrative and world. A good example is Devil Man, a series in which the central dynamic between Ryo and Akira is directly correlated to the larger workings of its universe and is also directly responsible for the subsequent apocalypse within the manga. Another, perhaps more popular example is of course Evangelion. As outlined in the introduction, Ava and Attack on Titan obviously share a lot of similarities both content-wise and from a meta perspective, and so it is no wonder that Ava 2 is a great example of the Sekai K narrative, a story in which the fate of all of humanity is wholly dependent upon one hopelessly overwhelmed teenage boy's sanity. And when I formulate it like that, it becomes clear why Attack on Titan 
Titan is so similar. It is the story of Eren Jaeger and Mikasa Ackerman, of a hunter who falls in love. The hunter is taught the value of life by the farmer, and the farmer is taught how to survive by the hunter. Their dynamic not only influences, but inherently defines the fate of the world all the characters inhabit. In this way, Mikasa is not only integral to Eren's life in isolation, but to the life of everyone within this series. She is such a perfect representation of all these themes that it is her specifically whose actions free Ymir and thus end the Titan curse as a result. She is the ideal lens from which to view and evaluate the world of Attack on Titan, and in turn, the world we ourselves inhabit. Her love is not subservience. It is neither a burden nor a duty. It is simply what she has felt ever since he wrapped that scarf around her. She is the perfect counter-argument to the self-defeating perspective that simply because fate is set in stone, things become meaningless. The love she communicates, the bond she has built with Eren, are endowed with meaning beyond the way fate unfolds, as an end to itself. The Sekai K nature is also represented in Eren's function as the narrative's god, so to speak. In particular, it extends his relationship with Mikasa and the themes tied to this dynamic onto the whole world, a thing that works seamlessly with respect to the general thematic layout. Beauty in a cruel world, two ways in which to view this mess we call life. Eren, the boy who forcibly attempted to tear down the walls in front of him, but who ironically never managed to move past them, only pushing them forward, and Mikasa, the flower which blooms in the soil, even when drenched with blood. Mikasa is effectively the first and last thing Eren sees according to the loop, and she is the only one of which he does not know the full extent of their actions. She is not privy to becoming a titan, which means she is immune to the memory wiping abilities of the founder as an Ackerman. Eren's eyes were closed during his final moments, only looking up once Mikasa had already sliced off his head, and only awakening again once he wakes from the dream in chapter 1. The nature of the paths created by Ymir's founding titan is especially interesting when applied to Eren as the new founder. Paths connect every single Eldian based on Ymir's desire to connect with people. They all converge on a single point the coordinates, or the founding titan. Couple this with the nature of Eren's attack titan and things get incredibly interesting. When they are used in conjunction, Eren begins to experience time as a flat circle, as well as to see the memories of every Eldian, meaning Eren's subjective experience of his life is stuck in a never-ending loop. Considering how almost every single step of the way in the story came about as a product of Eren's desire, as well as the fact Eren's consciousness exists in eternity, Due to the nature of paths, he experiences the story from chapter 1, page 13, until the very moment Mikasa cuts off his head. Subjective is the key word here, it feels like he's re-experiencing these events ad infinitum. Whether there is an actual mechanical time loop here where Eren's consciousness literally returns to that moment in chapter 1 is besides the point. Isayama's editor Kawakubo specifically states in this interview that despite the implications of a time loop, it is intentionally left open-ended and the final answer lies with the reader. It is up to them to decide if there is a time loop or not, which once again is a very neat example of Isayama actively integrating the reader's interpretations onto the work. That is why Mikasa's see you later Eren is so contextually significant, and why Eren cries when waking up from his own long dream, as well as why he questions Mikasa's hair, wondering when she let it grow out, as opposed to her short cut in the future, as well as during the long dream cabin sequence. I'd say there are two ways you can interpret this. A literal time loop where Eren is forced to constantly relive the events of the story, shackling him to Shingeki no Kyojin as a slave of his own actions, or as the rumbling takes place, Eren is experiencing this in his head for what feels like an eternity until Mikasa finally frees him from this self-inflicted cycle of suffering. In my opinion, both interpretations suffice and slot into the thematics of the story's ending pretty perfectly. This framing of the loop is also what rationalizes Ymir's decision to view things from Mikasa's eyes, why she was the one to enable her catharsis and set her free from her own cycle. 
Eren was incapable because he, like Ymir, was shackled to a cycle, and in that sense, in both interpretations, Mikasa is the one that ends Eren's cycle, being the one to enable him to experience something for himself, something with his own five senses, something he has not already traversed through somebody else prior, even if that final thing were to be his death. For Eren, freedom is the right to have his own experiences, and Mikasa embodies what it means to be free by making her choice and in turn, providing Eren with some semblance of freedom in his final moments by giving him his own new experience. It is just as Zeke says in 137. Perhaps one's final moments brings relief, maybe the end of your days being manipulated all in the name of multiplication without ever knowing if it means anything at all feels like freedom. In that way Eren only truly felt free in his dying moments as Mikasa cuts off his head. This renders the title of The Long Dream painfully ironic. Eren's mind state is so distorted by his ability to perceive time as a flat circle, he views his reality as a dreamlike state and by having his head chopped off by Mikasa, he awakens from this long dream in death. The only character besides Eren and Mikasa who has equal significance to Attack on Titan's final say is of course Armin. EMA is the core of this story. Their interpersonal dynamics with one another, as well as the overall dynamic of the trio, is by far the most important in the entire story. And Armin's role in particular is that of the storyteller, the one who conveys the story of his two best friends to us, the reader. Throughout the series, the framing of certain characters changes to reveal characteristics that are significant to the larger commentary of the series. Armin is perhaps the quintessential example of this. While off bat he was always presented as a bright kid, one creative and witty enough to orchestrate strategies and formulate plans, the way his nature and how it's explored shifts over time is telling of Isayama's attitude as a storyteller. Armin slowly but surely becomes one of humanity's most valuable assets. One so integral in fact that, in large part, humanity's survival rides on his shoulders. But what is this thing unique to Armin that characterizes him? In essence, it boils down to his curiosity and hope, untainted by a strong personal agenda. His perspective and methodology to everything is pure. He doesn't act based upon grudges or due to the circumstances that inform his decisions. He is simply on a quest for knowledge, aware of his own ignorance, and filled with the hope of having his horizon expanded. While obviously not being the only character to be driven by intense curiosity in the series, you will have a hard time finding anyone who approaches it with as open of a mind as Armin does, and this very thing is what makes him the perfect breeding ground for humanity's hope and the path to overcoming the cycle of hatred. These very characteristics are why Eren elaborated upon his acts only in front of Armin. While initially it seems to us that Eren and Armin shared a similar motivation, with time it became clear how their natures are so vastly different to the point of their approach to the same idea of reaching the sea becoming very distinct from one another. Isayama himself commented on this, saying that Armin's connection to the sea was based upon a pure quest for knowledge and a need to verify the sea's existence, whereas Eren purely assumed the sea exists and was preoccupied with the things holding him back from seeing. It. This too is a key point in illustrating the effects of generational trauma and the cyclicality of hatred and baggage. Eren, one so driven by rage and frustration with a world completely out of his hands, ironically remained as caged as he always was despite possessing the power of a deity. Meanwhile, Armin, a subject to the very same circumstances, manages to get by in his path to understanding and existing within the world he inhabits. Similar to Mikasa, their nature is in balance with their environment. They live in harmony with the cruel world they are subject to, in turn being free within the confines that Eren could not exist within. As such, Isayama is pointing towards this purity in the pursuit of knowledge, this unbiased disposition that enables true transparent dialogue. Ones untainted by the sins of the father, the propaganda of the elite, the vitriol of the suffering, as the road to carving a beautiful future. And so no wonder that Armin fulfills the function of a narrator.
better. Who better than somebody whose biases are repressed? Somebody who wishes for nothing more than the unfiltered truth? Somebody who would not present Eren in a biased way, one way or another, be it in favour of him or against him? This disposition makes him the perfect ambassador for peace, not only in universe but on a metatextual level as well. Armin is the one conveying this story to us, hence why his last words are, let's tell them everything to talk it out, to come to a mutual understanding on the basis of humanity, to not become slaves to primal or intrinsic fears and rages, and instead work together. That is what Attack on Titan is aiming for, and that's what makes the final alliance so effective. This is a group of people who have managed to look past their differences, their hate for one another, the atrocities they've committed against each other. Warriors, Survey Corps members, Marlians and Eldians, none of that matters anymore. All that matters is the fight for humanity. They sat around that campfire and finally understood their greatest mistake. Wrapped in the final words of Marco was a nugget of sentiment and wisdom that would go on to define the mentality of this small handful of once enemies allied against Eren's rumbling. We haven't even had a chance to talk this over. Such a simple string of words packed with such profound meaning. And it is Armin who goes on to embody these words best. Transparent, honest discourse. By Armin's methodology can we avoid the dilemma of our fear of death conflicting with our tendency to multiply, resulting to mutual cooperation instead of hierarchies based on fears and hate that simply breed more fears and more hate. In the end, Mikasa's choice frees Ymir from her endless nightmare, her own self-imposed slavery to paths. Mikasa's choice to kill somebody she loved showed Ymir that her own sense of love to the king was twisted. She served him out of desperation and loneliness. She mistook her connection to the king that was born out of usefulness as a military tool for love, when the real love she felt was to her children. Her eyes are finally opened. She can finally pass on and the titan curse is lifted. But despite that, conflict persists. War and hatred persists. The final pages, or the end credits in the anime, are harrowing in their realism. As Paradis is attacked by fighter jets some unknowable time in the distant future. But there's an undeniable layer of optimism in this conclusion. With respect to the life cycle, Eren's body becomes fuel for a forest within Paradis, and we briefly see an unnamed child figure enter the forest. The framing of this scene seems to suggest that the hallucinogenia, or source of all living matter, is present within this same tree that has grown to resemble the one Ymir stepped inside before being turned into the first titan. It suggests that the cycle repeats, that conflict is inescapable and where there is love, there will be hate. A commentary on human nature, one that seems rather pessimistic and steeped in negativity. Was the entire story for nothing? Is that the message at the end of the day, that humans are doomed to a perpetual cycle of hate and suffering? It seems that way, it, it really does, but I don't think so. And I think there's one detail that draws a brilliant contrast between this child in the final scene of Attack on Titan and Ymir 2000 years before the start of the story. Ymir was forced into the forest by Fritz's soldiers who used hunting dogs to chase her. But now this child is shown entering this forest out of their own volition, and the dog is a pet. I think this was Isayama's way of saying that yes, the cycle did repeat or continue, but it will never be the exact same. The cycle is contingent to the human condition, and humanity is both cruel and beautiful. Ymir was passive and submissive even with all the power in the world due to her trauma and desire for connection. Eren, at least in disposition, was the antithesis, a raging fire so preoccupied with the condition of his world that he failed to see his blessings and the love that was right beside him all along. And this unnamed child of the forest will have their own story, one we are not privy to, one we don't need to experience. The source of all living matter which birthed the titans is essentially a wish-granting genie. Coming into contact with this child doesn't necessarily mean the titans will make a return. They were specifically a product of Ymir's own desires. Instead, this child's story will be coloured by his own desires, his own agency, in this predetermined world where conflict seems to be inescapable. And I think that's rather powerful.
What does the divisive nature of the ending among fans tell us about Attack on Titan's themes? It might come as a surprise to some, but based on the reaction of the larger fanbase at the time of the manga's ending, there are certain things that can be extracted from the reaction of people. For one, a lot of the criticism for Isayama and the ending came from the emasculation of Eren in the finale, how pathetic he was framed and the whiplash that gave to people who had conceived a different image of him. And that is something the story very intentionally does. Eren was playing a character throughout post timeskip. He was enacting a role he was burdened with by none other than himself, and the vulnerable boy inside of him had always been there, hidden away. It speaks to the projection of some fans, projection of their wishes onto Eren their idea of what constitutes a cool or masculine protagonist, their expectations for the story and how they envisioned it to unfold. A bulk of the criticisms I've seen are very much lashing out against the story for not adhering to standards imposed upon it by readers for not fulfilling their wishes. Of course, this is not the case for everybody, and I'm not here to discredit any and all criticism of the ending, as I myself have my fair share of critiques for AOT. By no means do I believe it to be the perfect work. Despite that, I find it incredibly ironic that a story with the ultimate message that transparent discourse is the only solution to generational cycles of hatred is stained by hatred for its conclusion with very little actual discourse. It's just a bunch of Eren crying memes every Everywhere. Very few people have actually elaborated upon their issues with the ending, and the few who have, at least in my experience, have showcased fundamental misunderstandings of the story being told, as well as impositions onto the story of what they would have liked to see. But this video is not meant to serve as a rebuttal to any of those criticisms. The point of this video is not to combat criticism and drag my nuts over the ending haters as I make bold claims like AOT's ending is perfection. This is a retrospective perspective, a look at the entire story with the context of the ending in mind. I don't care who you ship Eren with, I care for the final choices Isayama made as its author and what those choices mean for the story as a whole. If you'd like to see a video where I directly address some of the more popular criticisms of the ending and do my best to dissect my issues with them, do let me know as that is something I have been considering. I disliked chapter 139 when I first read it. I was not satisfied. Ironically, I think that's exactly what Isayama wanted me to feel. Attack on Titan isn't the kind of story you should finish feeling satisfied. And because I've always loved this story so much, I spent days, weeks discussing with others about my issues with the conclusion. You know what I learned during that time? That my issues came from a place of misunderstanding. That I could not come up with a single suitable alternative that would do anywhere near as much justice to the story as the ending we received. Of course, I can only speak for myself. And like I said, I don't believe the ending is perfect. But it damn sure comes close. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you, Isayama, for Attack on Titan and goodbye to the boy who sought freedom.